I didn't think you'd enjoy that. As I said, I spent 20 years on Wall Street and a bunch of years in politics, so I have worked in the two worst occupations in America. Uh, so um, we'll see. It can only go up from here, I suppose. I've been a, a professor at Rutgers now for seven years. Uh, I'll give you a quick tour of my background, and then we'll talk about some experiences and share those with you and uh, learn a little bit about you and open it up for discussion and see where that goes as well. And I presented a few ideas, we'll go through those too, okay? The idea is not to make this a lecture because, well, I'm not being paid to lecture, so instead we'll make it more of a conversation. How's that? Um, as Dr. Kim said, um, I worked on Wall Street for a number of years. In fact, I had deja vu coming here today. The, um, my background is I went to Rutgers. After Rutgers, I went to University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, and then I went to Drexel. And then I ran out of money and had to get a job. So I started working in investment banking for Morgan Stanley. I spent 10 years at Morgan Stanley, uh, about half of that time outside the United States. And um, have any of you been my students, undergrad students? I thought somebody looked at me. Yeah, how are you? Good, I'm glad it all worked out. <laughs> how, how, how did I do? Okay, good. <laughs> Um, thank God. He's a plant, right, Dr. Kim? You put him there. Um, so, was it a finance class or economics? Personal finance. Oh, excellent. Okay, good. Um, what the heck was I talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, so then I ran out of money and went to work for Morgan Stanley. Spent 10 years there uh, in investment banking and uh, five years outside the United States in Europe and in Asia for a couple of years. And uh, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I was on the institutional side of the business. Um, working with pension funds, endowments, and governments. I left Morgan Stanley, went to Merrill Lynch, and that's where I had the deja vu, because this used to be, this complex, you may or may not know, if you live in this area, you probably remember, this used to be, this whole entire complex, the North American headquarters for Merrill Lynch. Indeed, now it's a drug company, I think, Novo Nordisk, and this is the conference center, but this was the corporate headquarters for Merrill Lynch when Merrill Lynch was pre-Bank of America days. I spent 10 years at Merrill Lynch, or 11 years almost, running the corporate stock option business here, not too many pods down, in fact. So, and I haven't been back here since, so that was a while ago uh, that I retired from Merrill Lynch in 2005. So it's, um, I just texted my wife on the way and I said, I, just all sort of a flood of memories, mostly good. Um, I retired from Merrill Lynch in 05 and um, then set up my own advisory wealth management practice in Moorestown, New Jersey. Not Moorestown, but Moorestown in Burlington County, New Jersey. That way, not that way. Uh, where we we manage just over about $100 million worth of client money today. And uh, as I said, I also teach at Rutgers part-time. And if I look familiar, it's because I work for Fox News part-time. And I do a couple segments a week on, um, on Fox for them. Finance, economics, stuff like that. Um, so, that's my quick background, and with your permission, just to help me understand better who we've got here, who are you? I'm, I'm Mario Savino. Mario <laughs> <laughs> A little too light for that. No, I'm Michael Boyle. I, uh, I work there. Yeah, I'm How you doing? Good. I, I, I've got the 20 years of corporate time Okay. Are you living in this area? I live in Albridge, New Jersey. Okay. So you're coming that way. Yeah. yeah. How about you? How about me? Um, I am Robin Wagner, and my husband and I own a um, insurance, public insurance adjustment firm. Oh, cool. Doyle Okay. Good stuff. And you, sir? I am uh, Clayton Kice. I live in Cinnamon. So we're kind of like oh, yeah. We're here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've been working for defense contractors for 10 years, doing finance, accounting, um, cool. relevant. So. All right. Uh, Jason Simons. I went to Penn State. I um, spent a couple of years in public accounting, and then now I'm working for Christmas. Uh, good. My name is Greg Joyce. I'm uh, from Rutgers. I um, work for a Pennsylvania uh, Teachers Savings Company, which is Jenny Jersey. Hmm. Greg, are you related to Jenny Jersey? Just, just curious. <laughs> she works with me over at Fox News. Uh, Brian Maloney, I work at a public accounting firm in the Oak Shade. Keith Lee and Miami with Mary Lynch. Yeah. All right, say hey. I'm also a local graduate master's degree right now. I'm a student of the Bank of Experience in the University of Mary Lynch. You work for 
Yeah. Oh, where? Uh, I mean, at, at, at the what we call the new campus, right. which of course isn't new anymore. Yeah. Maybe a map of the other you know, which is from County down in Manila, South Jersey. Oh, so you've got a bit of a commute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had a year of students for all this Good deal. Uh, Dr. Grimm works for Jersey Title in the county. I'm down in Mount Wallace. Oh, so you've got commute as well, coming up as well. You know? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Sean Moran. I work for uh, Diamond Settlement Services. I'm a title company in Bucks County. <coughs> Excellent. I am the real Mario. You are the real Mario. <laughs> <laughs> real Slim Shady. I used to run the accounting department for a collection agency for 18 years. And the past two years I've been happily doing this program. Excellent. Right. Hi, uh, my name is Waka Tatero. Um, currently, I work for Subaru of America. In Cherry Hill? Yes. Soon to be Camden. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I work uh, for, uh, I, I am a accountant for uh, seven years. Do you know Mike Annis? Does that name ring a bell? Michael, uh, <coughs> no, He's, he runs know. dealer services for oh, Subaru okay. in North America. And you are? My name is Deborah Herantri. This pushes the boundaries of laptop. <laughs> That's almost a desktop. I know who you are. So um, thank you for sharing that. Hey, do you mind if we start with a little quiz, a fun quiz? Why not? Just to sort of see how we do. Break dice a little bit. So keep your own score. Just write your answers down on a piece of paper. You can't participate, Dr. Kim, because you know all the answers. But see how we do, right? Number one, right? We're going to go really quickly. Yes, this is an accounting program. And yes, we're going to talk about Wall Street and politics and stuff, but this is sort of gl glide us into the discussion. Number one, you ready? Keep your own score. Number one, the largest, the largest employer in the world that's not a government, all right? So don't put U.S. military. The largest employer company in the world is who? Number two. We're going to go fast, right? Number two. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down how much so far this year? I already gave you a clue. It's not up. <laughs> is down how much so far this year? Number three. If Apple was a country, you all know Apple, right? I things, iPods, I things, all those stuff, right? All the eyes. If Apple was a country, and we were looking at its total sales as GDP, how big of a country would it be? In other words, where would it rank? There's about 200 countries in the world. Where would it rank in terms of size of GDP? Let's put a number on Number four, consumers, that would be you and I, consumers spend $36 million every hour at this store. Consumers spend 36 million bucks every single hour, 24-7, 365 days a year, at this store. What store? Number five. Accountants will know this one. The single most important factor in determining your credit score is what? There's four factors that go into determining your credit score. What's the single most important one? Mr. Joyce knows because he took my undergraduate class. Number next, where are we? Number six, the average number of credit cards an American consumer has in her purse or his wallet. The average number of credit cards an American consumer has in her purse or his wallet. Number seven, the median, not medium, the median United States household income is how much? Yes, the median United States household income is how much? Number eight, federal debt, how much? Within a couple billion, how's that? Federal debt, how much? Number nine, if you work full time in the state of New Jersey and you earn minimum wage, as do Dr. Kim and I, 
<laughs> How much do you make a year? If you, and you're working for, full time, 40 hours a week, no vacation. If you're working 40 hours a week in the state of New Jersey, how much are you making in a year if you're earning the minimum wage? Number 10, what's the unemployment rate in the United States? Number 12, oh, sorry, number 11, what's the savings rate in the United States? The unemployment rate, savings rate. Number 12, the percent of total income taxes in this country, the percent of total income taxes, this is where the accountants light up when I say income taxes, the, the percent of total income taxes paid by the top 1% of all income earners. That dreaded evil 1%. The percent of total income taxes paid by the top 1% of all income earners. Number 13, what's the currency in Malaysia? Number 14, the current interest rate on federal student loans. Current interest rate on federal student loans. Number 15, the percent of undergraduates that graduate with at least one student loan. The percent of undergrads who graduate with at least one student loan. Number 16, average balance. Student loan. Student debt. That's probably a better way to say it. The average balance student debt. Number 17, just to beat this thing home, the average monthly payment for that student who's graduating with all that debt. The average monthly payment, and that might be you. Number 18, the highest paying college major is what? Not accounting, sorry. The highest paying college major, it's close. The highest paying college major is what? Number 19, the average lifetime earnings, sorry, how much more over the average lifetime will a college graduate earn than a high school graduate? On average, how much more will a college graduate earn over his or her lifetime versus a high school graduate? Number next. Who's on a $1 bill? Don't look. And finally, you want an extra credit question? In case you got one wrong. Who owns Count Customs? Who owns Count's Customs? Oh, uh, I know his first name. You ready? Enough. Let's do it. Let's keep your own score. Number one, who is the largest employer in the world? Dr. Kim, you can't answer. Walmart. Who is it? Walmart. Walmart. 2.2 million employees. Think about that for a second. Number, number two, how much is the Dow Jones Industrials down? Wall Street's not doing so good this year. How much is it down so far this year? How much? 20%. No. 5%. No. Ten? Close. 8.3%. If you're within a couple decimals, give it to yourself. Consumers spend, or sorry, Apple, if it were a country looking at their sales and measuring it against GDP, where would they rank in size? Anybody have an idea? Five? No. Where's that? Close. Well, I'm getting close. Number 44, just above Greece. And getting further. <laughs> and, and, and climbing rapidly. <laughs> Relative to Greece. Yeah. Their annual sales are about $235 billion. The Greek economy is about $230 billion. So they're lar as a company, they're larger than Greece. Consumers spend $36 million every single hour where? Walmart. 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 It's their world. We're just living in it. Right? Between Walmart and Apple, it's their world. We're just living in it. Number next. The single most important factor in your credit score is... Not how much debt you have. On time payment payments. history. History, yep. That's the single most important factor in your credit score. Number next. The average number of credit cards an American consumer has in her purse is how many? Six. No. Very close. 3.7. If you're close, give it to yourself. What's the size of the federal debt? Close. 17. I had 17. Skip seven. 18.9 Well, at least that's what it was this morning. It's probably 19 already by the time we get through the next hour. About, about 19 trillion bucks. And that works out to about $60,000 per person. Right? So you have your debt and everyone else's. So put that into context. Every one of us in this room owes 60 grand. 
If you have a newborn baby at home, she owns 60 grand. If you have a grandmom at home, she owns 60 grand. We're all in this thing for 60 grand at the moment. Number nine, if you work full time like Dr. Kim and I do and make minimum wage in the state of New Jersey, how much are you making this year? 16,000. Close. $17,430. Why? Because minimum wage is eight forty-eight an hour. Did you do seven? Number seven? No. Did I do seven? Oh, I apologize. Number seven, the median U.S. household income. Not average, but median. Pretty close. 53939. So let's call it 54 grand. All right. We did the federal debt. We did uh, working full time. Number 10, what's the unemployment rate right now? 4.9, right? Economists would consider that full employment, by the way. May not feel like it, but an economist would tell you that's full employment. What's the savings rate in this country? Nope. 5.5. So for every dollar that an American makes, he or she saves 5.5 cents and either puts it on Wall Street or puts it on in a savings account, but it goes somewhere. 5.5%. All right, here we go. Accountants light up on this one. If you take those top 1% of all income earners, what's the total amount of income taxes percentage that they're paying? 25. 20, 50. 36%. The top 1% of all income earners in this country pay 36% of all income taxes. Those evil one percenters. You know, the Wall Street types. What's the currency in Malaysia? No, it's not Bitcoin. <laughs> Ringgits. Malaysian ringgits. You have a few of those in your pocket, don't you, Dr. Kim? Federal student loan rate right now is how much? Close. 4.29%. That resets every July. But right now it's 4.29%. So if you're an undergrad, that's what you can get your loan at. Percent of students that are graduating with a loan? Higher. Not 50. 70%. 70% of all undergrads come out with a... Diploma and a payment book. The average balance for those poor undergrads is how much? Close. 29.7. Call it 30 grand. The average monthly payment, and remember a student loan is typically for 10 years, the average monthly payment is about 320 bucks. That's why so many are living in their parents' basement, tapped into mom and dad's Netflix. Number 18, the highest paying college major, although it may not be this year, the highest paying college major is what? Finance. Not nursing. Not economics. Finance. What kind? IT. No. Mechanical. GE. Engineering. Into the ground. Mining. Geo. Petroleum engineering. Oh, yeah, 89 sure. grand. Also, said that may not hold yeah. this year. That may not hold this year, but last year it was with the oil collapse. Lifetime earnings of you college grads, soon to be master's grads, but college grads versus your high school peers. 1.2 million? 1.1 million. Close enough. So on average, you all in this room, well, as grad students, it's even higher. You'll see a chart in a second. But as, grad, as undergrads, you'll earn a million point one more than your high school friend. You know, the cool kid that became a landscaper. And... <laughs> That was a joke. And who is on a one dollar bill? You got it. George Washington. What was the extra credit question? Who owns Count's Customs? Danny. Danny the brother man. Danny the Count. The real name Danny Coker. Give yourself the extra credit on that one. He's calling for brother man. How many of you got perfect score? Other than Dr. Kim. Perfect score. This is the smart group, I thought. You told me this was the really bright group. Oh, the ring it's through me. <laughs> the ring it's through me. In that case, you got a 19. We'll take it. Why do I start with this? Well, this is, it's not obviously directly related to Wall Street per se or politics per se, but it's sort of a lot of the current debate around Wall Street, money, politics. You know, we're in the beginnings of a presidential election, although it seems like it never ends. Um, a lot of those topics are sort of involved in what we're talking about and some of those questions. 
Um, Walmart, for example, you say, well, what's, his, what's Danny's fixation with Walmart? Walmart, as not only being the largest employer, but Walmart, as you probably know, uh, know from the news, last year they bumped up their minimum pay to nine bucks an hour. This year they're bumping it to 10 bucks an hour. And that's cost them two and a half billion dollars, their shareholders. And you also notice a couple weeks ago they announced they're closing 200 odd stores. And one of the reasons they gave, not the only reason, one of the reasons they gave is those stores are eh, not as profitable as they used to be. Why? Because they have to pay more to the folks working at those stores. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So anyway, I thought you'd have a little fun with that. Why not? Here's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes, with your permission. Talk about some things going on at Wall Street, some of the debates, um, some of the current policy issues, public policy issues, and maybe some ideas and what I think, in my humble opinion, as a layperson, what a valued accounting professional is going to look like in the future. That's Oprah. <laughs> Who's that? Katie Perry. Katie Perry earned 110 million bucks last year for screeching. So <laughs> she is then in the top 1%. These evil 1%ers, these gals pulling all, all the loot, right? If you're in the, you, don't worry about the chart, but you just sort of look directionally. If you're in the top 1%, you earned last year 20% of all national income. So if you're in the top 1%, that would be Dr. Kim, if you're in the top 1% last year, you and your cohorts earned 20% of all the income in this country. Is it any surprise then that these politicians blather on forever about inequality, income inequality, right? It's a hot topic. We'll talk a little bit about that. There we go. Uh, I know you can't see this. Suffice to say, uh, I'll just kind of point out, the top 10% of all income earners in this country, this is astounding, the top 10% of all income in this earners, earners in this country paid 71% of all taxes. So your clients, if you're in public accounting, those really wealthy ones, right? Actually, maybe not the really wealthy, just the top 10% are paying 71% of all the taxes in this country. I thought you did, uh, uh, being accountants, I thought you'd all enjoy this. So one of the debates this year that sort of ties in Wall Street and, and politics, one of the debates this year is um, capital gains rates, right? Taxes in general, right? But capital gains rates is one that I thought was sort of interesting. Why? If you look at this, the red, this is the historic line for capital gains rates. You know, it's sort of 25%, bumps up to 40%. Now the highest, as you probably know, is around about 23%, something like that. Capital gains, as you know, being tax on profit from certain investments, stock investments, real estate, you know, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> so currently, the capital gains rate ranges anywhere from zero to about 24%, <clears throat> depending on your income, right? So for those of you in public accounting, you probably live and breathe this stuff, and you know it better than I do. But if you're below a certain income threshold and you have a capital gain, you pay nothing. If you're one of those evil one percenters and you have a capital gain, you pay 23.8%. If it's a long-term gain, short-term is a whole other story. One of our presidential candidates, I just picked on Hillary because I think, you know, at least on one side, she's the obvious choice in terms of it looks like she's going to win. Um, and that's not a political commentary, it's just based on my opinion. Hillary has proposed in a formal speech that she would like to see that increase to a minimum of 20% up to 37%. Okay. The F word, not that one, Mario, the other one. <laughs> Is it fair? Right? Obviously, this whole debate about taxes and you know, how much should we tax the wealthy and who should not pay tax, all this other nonsense, it always comes down to the F word. Is it fair? What's fair? What's equitable? In a market-based economy like ours, what's fair? The interesting thing about the capital gains tax I thought you'd enjoy is when you think about it, it's a voluntary tax. How's it voluntary? You don't have to, you don't have to pay it if you don't sell anything, right? As an investor, on Wall Street or anywhere else, if you're sitting on a huge gain and you don't want to pay the tax, sit on the gain. Now, of course, the risk is that that gain could evaporate if that investment declines, as the stock market has done over the last few weeks. 
But the interesting thing about this tax, unlike an income tax, is it's voluntary when you kind of think about it in that context. The other interesting thing about the capital gains tax is what I call the death loophole. What's that for the account, the public accounts in the room? What's the death loophole? Maybe, I didn't, maybe it's a bad nickname. I don't know. How about this? When you croak, your heirs inherit those assets at what? Stepped up basis. At a stepped up cost basis. A lot of politicians, including Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, don't think that's fair. They'd like to eliminate that loophole, right? So that when grandma croaks and leaves you money or stocks, you would not get a stepped up cost basis. So is it fair? Eh, obviously, it's a matter of debate. But I just thought you'd find that sort of interesting. This is one of the debates going on right now in our country as, as these you know, folks are trying to become president, trying to figure out what is fair, what's the best way to do this. Again, don't worry about the numbers necessarily, but I thought we'd find this interesting is that the, um, the blue line here, the dark blue line, is the capital gains um, rate over time, right? This line shows us, or sorry, it's reversed how much money we collect versus the rate. The idea being, throughout history, generally speaking, when we reduce the rate, we collect more tax, which sounds sort of weird. Why would that be? More people invest and more people... Cash out. Sell, cash out, right? We're human, right? So therefore, if you're gonna say, well, if I'm sitting on this investment, I've got this huge gain, and now you're coming in with a lower rate, now's the time to bail. And that's precisely throughout history what's happened. As the rates have come down, people sell, generate more taxes. Conversely, as the rates have gone up, people say, well, I think I'll just hold this for a second. I can't tell you the number of times clients of mine over the years have said, I don't want to sell this because I don't want to pay taxes. Now, from a tax perspective, that might be quite logical. From an investment perspective, it's usually not the right answer, right? You usually don't want to hold an investment just because of a tax consequence, as you probably know in your own practice. It's a factor, but it shouldn't be the determining factor, right? But it's important. Important, then you translate this to the macro economy. Why is this so important? I mean, this sort of arc, arcane little capital. The reason why it's important is because when you think about it, this is sort of part of the engine room, right? This is the boiler room in the economy. People investing, taking risk, right? You want entrepreneurs to invest. You want people to take risks. Why? Because they hire, you know, they create jobs, they create prosperity, create wealth. They also create failure. There's no guarantees. One of the other debates at the moment. Back in 2010, you might remember after the financial collapse, um, we had this new thing called the Dodd-Frank Law. And some of you probably deal with this on a daily basis in your jobs, in terms of reporting and whatnot. Um, the Dodd-Frank Law, amongst other things, requires a clawback of pay in case of fraud. So if you're a Wall Street executive that's aimed at, the whole idea here was you know, to sort of rein in Wall Street, tame Wall Street, right? <clears throat> Wall Street's a great target. Um, my wife the other day, who has zero experience on Wall Street, none whatsoever, other than the fact she married a geek, said, <laughs> why all this you know, vitriol toward Wall Street? Right? Even Donald Trump hates Wall Street. You know, they all hate Wall Street. Right? It's nice. Right? It's a good time right now to hate Wall Street. Right? Those evil bankers. I don't get it. Why all the vitriol? You know, but it is what it is. So one of the things in Dodd Frank, as you probably know, is that if an investment bank um, was found to have perpetuated some sort of fraud, the executives personally can have their compensation called back. Which is sort of interesting because it doesn't really apply to if Novo Nordisk right next door here, if the CEO for Novo Nordisk was found guilty of fraud, she or he might go to jail, right? Might have to pay a fine, but there's no clawback on their compensation, at least from a statute point of view. It's kind of weird, but nonetheless, that's the environment we live in. So pity. The poor venture capitalist. Pity the poor risk taker. So if you're on Wall Street, maybe some of you are in that industry, 
you're sitting up there and you're making decisions about how to deploy capital, what companies to invest in, what companies to stay away from, right? So if you're that venture capitalist or private equity firm or Wall Street firm, if you're that venture capitalist, one of the things that you think about is, well, how's it going to be taxed? And again, in the midst of a presidential debate, it's sort of the, the lines have kind of blurred. You've got, on the Democratic side, two candidates saying, tax it as ordinary income, profits from those investments. And on the Republican side, you have a couple of them. I know Trump has, maybe maybe one other, I can't think right now, have uh, said, yeah, we should tax Wall Street the same way we're taxing individuals. So if you're, invest, if you're a private investor and you're investing in some company out in you know, Cupertino, California, a startup, and you're making a killing, rather than treat it as some sort of capital gains, let's treat it as ordinary income and tax you that way. The counter argument is, well, we don't want to do that because we want to encourage risk taking. We want to encourage people to uh, you know, put some skin in the game. We don't want to tax them too highly. Yeah, we'll see what happens. So here's where we are today. In the state of New Jersey, the minimum wage is $8.38 an hour. Um, if you were up really early yesterday, you saw me on the news, I was talking about, should we increase the minimum wage? There's a proposal now in New Jersey to amend the state constitution to change the minimum wage, keep it locked in with CPI inflation, and go to $15 over the next few years. Go from $8.48 to 15 bucks. The argument, obviously, is if we increase minimum wage, we'll increase people's buying power, right? People are more wealthy. And what are they going to do? They're going to spend the money. And that sort of boosts the economy. Okay? Fair enough. Why do we want to do that? Because income growth, as you probably know, although in your careers you probably are doing quite fine, but for most Americans, income growth over the last decade has been virtually stagnant. Right now it's about 1.3% a year. Another way to say that, we ain't getting raises. I'm not. Are you, Dr. Kim? No. no. <laughs> right? So as a group, Americans generally, American workers, we have jobs, unemployment rate, 4.9%, close to an all-time low. So we have jobs, but they tend to be lower-paying jobs in many cases, and so far we haven't seen wage growth, income growth. So it's a perfect setup for then politicians to come in and say, well, those guys on Wall Street are doing great. You know, Record profits at Goldman Sachs last year. Lloyd Blankfein made 50 million bucks last year, the CEO for Goldman Sachs. But, right, the person working in Prioria, in the middle of the country, she or he didn't get a raise. Is it fair? And how do we address that? And one of the ways they want to address it, although I think simplistically, is, well, let's raise the minimum wage. The interesting thing, though, when you hear this sort of debate, what I would encourage you to do always is sort of go beyond the headline a little bit. So the question I asked myself when I was getting ready to do this segment on television the other day is, well, who the heck actually makes minimum wage? The numbers are pretty interesting. There's one and a half million workers in this country that make minimum wage. That's about 2% of all workers in the United States. That's a lot of people. One and a half million people, a lot of people, right? 50% of them are under age 25. So half of them are under age 25. 64% of them are part-time workers. I didn't put the number up there, but about half of them within the first six months of their job are making more than the minimum wage. So a minimum wage sort of, I think, is a little bit um, disingenuous. We should probably call it a youth wage or a temporary wage, because that's essentially what it is in this country. Very few workers make minimum wage for a long time. Very few older workers make minimum wage for a very long. So there's sort of this misnomer that if you go work at you know McDonald's making eight dollars and forty eight cents an hour and you're forty years old, you're gonna make it forever. Not so much true. Nonetheless. So we have winners and losers. The Congressional Budget Office, that group of accountant types down in Washington, DC, who are nonpartisan, so there's no politics here, at least I don't think. You know, the pointy headed smart folks. When they looked at this, they said, okay, if we raise the minimum wage in this country. 
to $15 an hour, what happens? Their estimate is 16 and a half million workers get a raise. So these folks get a raise right away. But then it has this sort of ripple effect. Because then Dr. Kim and I walk down to the dean and say, hey, you just gave the secretary a raise. How about me? Right? So they estimate that 16 and a half million of us eventually will have this sort of ripple effect. More money in our Friday paycheck. Not so bad. The bad part is, in the same study, they also estimate that just over a half a million workers get fired, right, as, as employers who can't afford it cut back. So it begs the question, it's a public policy issue, but it begs the question, is it, you know, what do we do? Is it right or wrong? Is it good or bad? And like many things in public policy, I guess it's supposed, it depends on who you are. If you're one of the six and a half, 16 and a half million workers, that's great. I'm getting a raise. If you're one of the folks that just lost your job, not so great. And disproportionately, as you probably know, it hurts different groups. Small businesses, are they tend to be hurt more than large businesses because they don't have the pricing power. They don't have the margin that large businesses have, typically. So they, they get hurt more, right? The daycare center down the road that has three or four employees, they're hurt. Younger workers, unskilled workers, disproportionately are hurt more. So one of the things, uh, there's a senator in the state of New Jersey, Senator Sweeney, who's also trying to become the next governor. He's the one promoting this. And one of the things I suggested to him as he was thinking about that is try to strike some sort of balance and carve out, perhaps, a youth wage. So that if an employer hires someone under the age of, say, 21, for some period of time, they could pay them less than minimum wage. Carve out certain areas, Camden, Trenton, where you want to encourage more jobs. Maybe carve those out. Carve out um, time. In other words, make it a temporary thing. Say, for the first three months, it's this, and then it bumps up. In other words, let businesses bring workers on, give them some skills so they're more valuable then boost their wage. Right? So there's ways to do this, I think, that you can make it a little bit more accommodating. But what the heck do I know? So there's a couple of you here that are Pennsylvania residents. By the way, your state's in almost as bad shape as ours, and it's getting worse <laughs> as we speak because you have no budget for last year's fiscal year. Still, even though we're halfway through the fiscal year, more than halfway through mm -hmm. your fiscal year, you still have no state budget. Um, so your state is right behind us, but New Jersey has, has the New Jersey has the dubious honor of having this wonderful unfunded liability. Oh, sorry, of eighty-three billion dollars. How do we get this unfunded liability? Well, there's eight hundred thousand current and retired public employees, including, by the way, Dr. Kim and I, because we work as Rutgers, uh, Rutgers, as you know, is part of the system. So there's 800,000 folks that are either working in the public sector in New Jersey or already retired that we've made promises to. We've promised this guy a pension if he does certain things, stays a certain number of years. He contributes every every two weeks when Dr. King gets paid, money comes out of his paycheck and it goes into the pension system. So we've made him a promise. If you do your part, when you retire, we're going to give you a pension. Trouble is. The state, for many, many years, hasn't put their part into the system, as you probably know, and their investment returns have underachieved. That's how we got here. I thought this was an interesting number. Think about this. We're all taxpayers. 27 cents of every dollar that we pay in taxes, so 27 cents of every dollar that the state has to spend in just four years will go to pensions and health care for retirees. That's less money to plow the roads. That's less money to give to Rutgers, to subsidize students coming in, right? Obviously, it's, it's, it's not a good story. So more than 25% of all budget monies in just a few years are going to go to retirees. There's no easy answer on this one. You either increase taxes, reduce benefits, Cut Dr. Kim's pension, which he's not too crazy about. They already cut. They already cut. <laughs> That's true. I mean, they reformed, quote unquote, reformed it a few years ago. Um, 
But the one that most politicians just don't want to talk about for whatever reason it frustrates me is this last one. So we, the political battles are fought over, should we increase taxes? Should we cut our benefits? And the two sides are entrenched, you know. And by the way, mathematically, you can't raise taxes enough to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's not even a good option. Right? And mathematically, you can't cut benefits enough to fix this problem, really, realistically. The one they should be talking about is, how do we increase growth? Because if you increase economic growth, what do you do? Yeah, the base gets bigger. We're, we're, we collect more taxes, not proportionately, but in an absolute sense. Unfortunately, our state, as you know, like the state of Pennsylvania, is in a very sluggish growth mode. Virtually no growth. Virtually no growth. So they got to figure this out. When I was the mayor of Morristown for a number of years, during my dark period, um, that was a joke. When, um, we grappled with this every single year because every single year we would get from Trenton a number. And the number would say, this is what you, Morristown, New Jersey, have to contribute on behalf of your employees. We had 100 and some odd employees. This is what you have to contribute to their pension and their health care costs. And every year it would skyrocket, right? So this was a very real problem. I can tell you across the state, there's 560 some municipalities, way too many. There's 568 some municipalities, there's county governments, there's school districts, fire districts, you know how it goes. Universities, the accountants, the administrators, the, the CFOs, the mayors, as we speak, are trying to figure this out, saying, this math thing ain't working, right? Something's got to get. Better news. Is college a good investment? Well, you bet. So even with, even with some of the problems, as we saw in our little fun quiz, um, college is still a good investment. If you have a high school degree over the course of your life, uh, you're going to make about $1.3 million over the course of your working career versus you guys who are going to have master's degrees, you're going to make essentially double that. So that cool kid that, you know, in high school that's now a landscaper that you've seen at your high school reunion, haha, -ha, laughs on him because you're going to earn double him over the course of your lifetime. So that should make you feel good. But the dark side of this, of course, is it comes at a price. Right now in this country, we have about $1.2 trillion worth of student debt. Pretty big number. We went through some of those averages, so you kind of kind of know the picture. But the good news is, for you guys in this room, all is sunny. <laughs> right? Terrific. Here's Dr. Tim. This guy's doing great. <laughs> So um, I forgot to mention in my opening remarks that my most important occupation that I have is I have four kids. And uh, so most important for those of you who are parents, you know your most important job is mom or dad, right? So daughter number one, Dr. Kim's met some of my kids. Daughter number one is in med school and uh, racking up the debt and uh, tells me every once in a while when things are not going so well, dad, I don't think this is really going to be worth it. You know, and I keep saying, don't worry, you know, it'll be worth it. Just get through it. You know, you have this conversation with your daughter, too. And what I probably should say, to, and I, I kind of do to all my kids, and you'll say to your kids, is it's worth it if, right? Getting a PhD in basket weaving may not be worth the investment. You might feel really fulfilled, and you might be the best basket weaver on the planet, but you might not have a great economic return on your investment. There's other returns, right? Self-satisfaction, all that stuff. But economics, well, may not be there for you. What you're doing is a great return, obviously. Accounting is, as you know, a great, great field to go into. Plenty of jobs, good salaries, the whole bit. I don't have to tell you that. What are, what are good, what are bad? Well, I thought this was kind of interesting, not because doom and gloom, you know, there was a, a presidential candidate um, in one of the debates, they were beaten up on, as they always do, they're beaten up on Wall Street and whatnot. Anyway, one of the presidential candidates said, we need less college graduates who major in philosophy, and we need more welders. Now, what he was saying, what he was trying to communicate, is from an economic point of view, 
a welder, at least at this point in the economy, a welder has more economic value than an average philosophy major right, coming out of college. And that's not inaccurate, by the way. So who makes the most loot? Well, obviously all the engineers, right? They're, we always say the accountants are running the world. It's really the engineers that are running the world. They're, they're, you know, they're always sort of at the top in terms of salary. At the bottom, well, the usual suspects, social work, right? Psychology, not, probably not where you want to be necessarily. Um, some of the really bad, right? So when your kid comes home and says, mom, I'm majoring in animal science or social work, it's good to have a, a plan B, <laughs> right? It's good to have a plan B. But the reason I put this here is not to pick on these majors because I think all education is good education, not to pick on the majors, but to bring out a different element that we don't talk about enough, at least in my judgment. We're sort of missing the debate. The debate really, I think, should be about the market. The debate should be about the economic value. For example, what I'm trying to say here is, imagine this, imagine you're an undergraduate or even a grad student. You come to Rutgers and Rutgers says, well, you're gonna be a sociology major, right? That's what you're gonna pick. So the, the price per credit is 150 bucks. You're gonna be a petroleum engineering major, the price per credit's 400 bucks. In other words, price the education to match the market. Now, of course, no, no university on the planet does that, or at least not in this country. There's, you know, there'll be all sorts, of, all sorts of angst about that. But when you think about it, if you really believe in a market-based system, it makes perfect sense. You price the education relative to the economic value. And those values change over time, don't they? Of course they do. It's hard to do that, but it's sort of an interesting idea. Unfortunately, Dr. Kim and I and, and universities in general live in a world that market forces stop at the quad. They don't get past the quad, right? Universities are, are uh, notorious for being holdouts to an economic system that, well, I think is somewhat Byzantine. Oh from a different era. Would the philosophy professors be willing to take one third of the amount of Interesting the... question. So, I forget your first name. Sean. Sean says, hey, well, wait a minute, Danny. If you're really gonna do this, right, you pay your staff differently. An accounting professor should make a boatload of dough relative to the guy spinning pottery. Probably, right? They'll never, they'll never get that through the faculty senate. <laughs> you would like it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some problems, some ideas. So here's you accountants. That's you. Just because I can explain the theory of relativity, relativity doesn't mean I can understand the tax code. Well, our tax code, as you know, is now, in, it, it, again, in a political season, is the source of great political debate. And every candidate has put forth their own tax proposals. And we're gonna hear more about that ad nauseum over the next year or so, right? Um, Everything from a flat rate to, you know, in some cases like Bernie Sanders, the maximum rate of 90%, right? Let's go back to where we were in the 1970s. So you're gonna hear all these different ideas and different proposals. My idea to make this thing really simple, give it to Apple. Let them figure it out, right? Because think about it, they come up with very elegant solutions for virtually everything, they'll figure it out, right? So call Cupertino, California, and ask them to come up with a solution. Who knows, maybe they can do it. What should the government do? When we talk about Wall Street and regulate those bandits on Wall Street, what should the government role be? Well, on the left side, we have the playing field that's supposed to be level. That's what we're promised. We're all promised that things are supposed to be fair and that we're all gonna play the same rules. But of course, if you look on the right side, the reality is, it's not so fair all the time. And sometimes the rules favor one group over another group. And in fact, a lot of folks would argue right now that the rules favor these evil folks on Wall Street, these evil bankers who are unaccountable. Right? They ran our economy into a ditch in 2008 because they forced bad loans on unsuspecting millions of Americans who couldn't afford them. Remember that? The economy cratered. Americans, 4.2 million homes were foreclosed since then. 
Many of us went bankrupt and all, suffered all sorts of strife. While the bankers, well, they made their money. In some cases, they paid some fines, but none of them went to jail. Right? Bernie Sanders, one of the things he keeps saying over and over again is the bankers didn't go to jail. People lost their homes, but the bankers did okay. Those folks, those evil folks on Wall Street. Because they play to a different set of rules. The good news is, in my lifetime, and Dr. Kim's lifetime, I think we can share this with you with, with, with great confidence, at least I can, is that um, in a free market system like ours, no matter how screwed up it looks or gets, and sometimes it gets pretty screwed up, never underestimate the regenerative power of the markets, of free markets. Dr. Kim and I lived in the 1970s. Into the early 1980s, inflation was over 10%. Unemployment was over 10%. Remember? We had stagflation, remember? Our politics were broken. Hell, we couldn't get helicopters out of, uh, what is it, Iran. Remember all that bad stuff? Whip, whip inflation now, wind. Right? It was pretty grim. We survived. I tell my, my own kids this, I tell my students this, no matter what travails seem to be in front of us, no matter what headwinds seem to be in front of us, don't underestimate the power of free markets to figure it out. That's the good news. The bad news is, sometimes there's damage along the way. There's wreckage along the way. Particularly for us humans, if we don't have the right skill sets, it ain't easy, right? You all do, but some of your peers, some of your friends, some of your family members don't, and you've seen it personally, you've seen it firsthand, you've seen damage. People who've been left behind, people who can't get into the economy for whatever reason, can't get traction, someone who lost their home, right? So free markets are a wonderful thing, but not without their flaws. Wall Street works great, raises lots of capital for companies, gives lots of folks like me a good career. Sometimes it doesn't work great. 2008, right, didn't work so great then. Uh, the guy I used to work for, his name was Stan O'Neill, he was president and CEO of Merrill Lynch. His office was just in this book building right next door. I out the window earlier, I remember being in his office many times. And then I remember during the financial crisis, when they fired him, and uh, it didn't bother me, he was a creep, but uh, I remember watching him on TV, and, I, and my wife, who had also met him a few times, said, what's up with him? I said, oh, you know, I wish they were marching him out in, in, uh, in shackles, because he deserved it for lots of reasons, but so sometimes it doesn't work out so well. You all, accounting professionals. So, anybody like to gamble? You would admit it if you did. So, <laughs> table, you know what table stakes are, right? Just to get onto the table, you have to bring something to the table just to get into the game, right? For you non-gamblers, they're all looking at me saying, oh, I don't gamble, I don't gamble, sure, nice try. So, table stakes in your profession, you have to be smart, they're all smart, everybody's smart, right? You gotta have good technical skills. You got that as an undergraduate, you got that in your careers at Heathway and Flanagan and other places. You have to be responsive. When a client calls or a boss calls or a coworker calls, you want to respond quickly. Organize, right? These are sort of basic things that blocking and tackling that all of us have to bring to the workplace, bring to the marketplace. Table stakes. Not negotiable. You can't not have one of those. The value added folks in the room, the folks in the room that go beyond, whose careers will advance beyond, they go a little further. Organizations, whether it's Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, wherever I've worked, Rutgers, they value folks, not just who are smart, everybody's smart nowadays, <laughs> that commodity's really cheap. They value people who have insight, and there's a difference between being smart and being insightful. Insight allows us to apply wisdom to solve problems. Insight allows us to go beyond just the surface of the problem and think about different alternatives. Very good friend of mine, I'll tell you this quick story, very good friend of mine is the head of, well, interesting guy. 
he went to um, McGill University in Montreal. You all know McGill? Mm -hmm. You know McGill. It's one of the best universities in the world that a lot of folks have never heard of. After McGill, he decided to be a doctor. He went to medical school. He graduates medical school, and upon graduation, he said to his very disappointed parents, I don't think I want to be a doctor. <laughs> So he went back to school, he went to MIT, and got another master's degree in, I think it was chemical engineering. So no slouch, right? The guy's pretty bright. Today he heads up the uh, pharmaceutical, what they call life sciences practice for IBM, globally. So, you know, his clients are the big drug companies. And um, he always likes to say, when we at IBM, when we look for recruits for you know, professional positions or senior level positions, we see a lot of folks who can look at point A to point Z and figure out how to get there. No problem. But what we really want is we want people that can go from point A to point Z, not in a linear fashion, but who can understand how to get there tangentially. What he means by that is to think in dimensions, to think analytically, rather than just point A to point B. The reason why is I said because as you do that, you uncover opportunities that you never thought existed if you're just going from point A to point B. As I say, the smart guy. This is over pizza at Rico in Westmont, right? So imagine that heavy conversation. <laughs> Open the second bottle of wine. The marketplace, the marketplace wants you to be a subject matter expert, not just know the rules, not just know the accounting rules, but become an expert. Have your peers recognize you as the expert, whether it's on social media or in conferences or you know in your industry, whatever. But you want to be the person that others say, well, what do you think? Because you're the subject matter expert. What's your opinion? Over my career, I've hired probably thousands of people. When I retired from Merrill Lynch, I had about 2,500 people working for me in the division that I ran. And one of the things I always said to the boss, you know, my managers was, when you hire people, look for people who are innovative and creative. Not just smart, not just technically adept, but look for people who can create. Look for artists, right? Look for people who have that ability to go beyond just the textbook or just the solution and come up with something different and something new. One of my first, well, my first boss on Wall Street was a woman appropriately named Donna Wynn. I swear that was her real last name, Donna Wynn. And she hated to lose. And she was, she was, you know, if you've ever seen sort of Trading Places or the other one, the, what, the, what the Michael Douglas movie, what was that called? Was it called Wall Street? The Big Short, you know, you know all those sort of movies, right? If you've ever seen those movies and you've seen sort of the grizzled Wall Street characters who every other word's the F word and you know they're sexist, they're misogynist. That was her. She was a female, but that was her, right? Every other word out of her mouth, you didn't want to know. Okay. Really tough, really smart lady, my first boss. She always gave me a bunch of different nuggets. One of the nuggets she said to me once, I thought one day I was really clever. I went into her office and we had this problem about something. And I explained it. And she said, I don't pay you to bring me problems. I pay you to bring me solutions. End of the conversation. I went back to the trading floor, hat in hand. You know, what she said was right. And finally, this is a free market system, so we want folks that are risk takers. We want entrepreneurs. We want folks who are willing to take calculated, well thought out risk. Take a chance. Do something different, do something new. Questions, comments, suggestions. If you were awful quiet, too quiet, actually, that probably means I dominate the conversation, which I didn't mean to do. So, with that said, I'll open it up. Questions, comments. Could be anything. Dan, um, I had one. Um, You're not allowed. No, go ahead. After, after the uh, uh, long career you had, uh. how important to have Great question. Great question. 
So um, the, Dr. Kim's question was how important are accounting skills, at least in my experience and generally in the marketplace, incredibly important. And what I would say is obviously you know this better than I do. It's not just debits and credits. It's the analytical skills that go with it. In our practice now, the company that I own, uh, the women, one of the women that works with me and for me, and she's sort of maybe the future of the company in terms of if I retire or when I retire. She was an accounting major at Rutgers, so she has terrific accounting skills. But more than that, she's got these terrific analytical skills, problem-solving skills, right? Um, throughout my career, I've been blessed to work with lots of good people, uh, many of whom were accountants, uh, finance majors, etc. Um, funnily enough, the, the, the number one salesman I had under me when I was at Merrill Lynch was a, a former, I guess they would call it a reformed CPA, or CPA in denial. I'm not sure what you would call him nowadays. But he started out his career as a CPA, then he went to work for Yale University in their controllers department, and then we hired him here at Merrill Lynch, being a salesman. He was the best salesman we had. Because he could, this was for corporate stock options, we were, it, it was running the stock options, but because he could, you know, he had the analytical side down cold, but he also had the people skills, you know, sort of that classic personality to walk into a room and sell ice to an Eskimo, right? So, but that accountant background that he had, perfect. Perfect. Good question. I like that. Give me some more. Anything. Daughter number two is doing well. Dr. Kim met daughter number two last year. She's now a freshman in college. Um, so she would be here with me today as she came last year, but she's in San Diego, California, where it would be 84 degrees today. That's where she's in school. And she reminds me of that every day. Hey, sir, nobody has a question. I want to talk. Yeah, let's talk. <laughs> what do you I want to go back to the topic of uh, more tax rates on investment. Yeah. Plus you earn income. Right? Yeah. And for me, this whole start this all started when Warren Buffett made this comment. Remember it was Warren Buffett said nobody should no billionaire should pay less taxes as a percent of her or his income than their secretary. I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that his secretary earned income. Correct. Tax at a higher rate than his investment. Correct. So I guess the thinking here is that equality or, or what do you call it? Fairness. Equity, fairness. But I understand the other side of it is you want to reward people who take the risk. Sure. Now, here's my thought. I might be wrong. I'm probably a bunch of things wrong here. Which one out here or out? Yeah. All right. When you buy and sell stocks, right? The second and third purchase, the uh, what I would call the speculative sale. Okay. You know, like I sell you, you sell Mario, you sell Sean. I could see that possibly being taxed at the same rate. Okay. But with an IPO, Mm -hmm. Like you are technically funded, mm -hmm. or maybe you're rewarding somebody who's already done this, or where a company says we're going to use your stock to build another plant. Yep. I think, which is my thought, on this, that should be taxed. Because what you're back doing is you are now, and I guess that's the reason you're trying to tax division, is that you're rewarding people for taking that risk. Great question. Yeah. So, what is your thought? So, I'm going to say it a different way. So, the primary investment, whether, the primary. whether it's the initial stock sale, Right, the initial investment into a, a new technology company, new drug company. That primary investment, you believe, should be treated no, differently. Should be treated differently, because that is truly the risk risk taker, right? Um, versus the guy down the road, somewhere down the line, who second, third, fourth, fifth, billionth in line, who's buying nothing more than buying that piece of ownership from the previous owner. And probably transferring it to someone else as well, right? It's a great point, and, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of um, folks that would agree with that. I think on the other side of the argument, you would people would say, well, you can't have you can't have a successful capital market if if the um, if it stops at the source. In other words, you need that liquidity in the market by the second, third, no matter where you are down the line, you need that liquidity. To make sure that those folks up front feel comfortable that yeah, there's going to be enough liquidity in this thing that I can get out. Precisely. But Precisely. there's also the, the venture capitalists are the ones doing that Series A funding before it's public. Yeah. So then it goes IPO, right. and then they sell, 
Right. They cash in. Right. Yes, They're not going to be. So now, and those are the those VCs are the billionaires. Right. You're now effectively lowering their tax burden. And I'm yeah. Figure. So then the average investor or someone who's invested through like a state pension system, right. they're being taxed, they're whereas yep. the people with the real money are now paying right. less. Yep, good point. To none. That's a good debate. Yeah, and the Buffett rule, just, just to summarize, was they put the number 30% on it, or the president has put the number 30% on it. No one should, no billionaire should pay less than 30%, right, is kind of what they say. But the Buffett rule in general that he's referring to says, look, um, you shouldn't have high income earners on a percentage basis paying less than low income earners, not absolute dollars, percentage basis, right? You remember a few years ago, Mitt Romney was running for president. His tax rate, effective rate, was something like 15% or something. Why? Because most of his income came from capital, you know, passive income, capital gains or qualified dividend interest. Whereas Mitt Romney's secretary was probably paying 25%, or, you know, some other number. And that was not fair. So they said. But it's also the, again, there's also a risk involved. In no that. question. No question. No question. So there's two sides to that one. Yeah, I would say um, it's an interesting idea theoretically, but in practice it wouldn't work because you would gum up the liquidity down market. And then a lot of that passive income, too, is also through dividends. Mm -hmm which is, that's double tax. Yep. It's already taxed at the corporate level. It can't be issued unless it's already been paid tax on. Yeah. So, yeah, good point. So the way I see it, Mario. we have uh, three types of people that work in a an organization, right? So we have the worker, the planner, and the thinker, the one that's really okay. setting a drive. Clearly, the people in this room have moved beyond the worker stage yeah. and now have the credentials to be. You're all there. Um, CPA is the capstone, and I also think about CMA because I want to be part of the business and drive it forward. Okay. Besides what you show there as to what you bring to the table and how you get ahead, um, as part of career advice for everybody, and to strengthen a career path. Ah, great question. What do you have yeah, to yeah, yeah. that? So I, I, I share this with my own kids, and I also share this with my students at Rutgers. When Dr. Kim and I were at Rutgers, or at Drexel, or Penn, wherever we were, and we were students, we were competing with the gal sitting next to us for a job. Really. You're competing with the gal sitting next to you for a job, but you're also competing with the gal in Riyadh, the gal in Paris, the gal in, you see where I'm going with this, right? So we had a much more narrow competitive set than you have. Therefore, your skill set has to be a little bit different than our skill set was. It has to be much more global. It has, has a much wider view to it. So language skills, skills beyond just one border, incredibly important, right? Um, just by going around the room, I can tell some of you have a couple of language skills. Um, not, not, just, not just language skills themselves, but the ability, because most businesses now are global, right? The ability to go beyond just one set of rules is important. Um, really hard to find. Really hard to find those skills. Really hard to find someone that has that. I was blessed in my career that I got to spend a good part of it outside the United States. 